Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have been here before, and um, it's always nice to, to be among friends and with a lot of young people, so I'm really enjoying that. When Madeline mentioned about immigrants, I was thinking that uh, my, my ancestors emigrated to Canada in, uh, in the 1840s as part of the potato famine in Ireland, and that was really dramatic. Uh, at the time, there were nine million people in Ireland. Uh, one third emigrated, one third died, and one third are there. And, and the population of Ireland stayed at three million for 100, 150 years. <laughs> so it's, uh, these things can be quite dramatic, and they're, and they're all over the place. Um, what I want to talk about is agriculture and food, and I'll put a lot of emphasis on food in the post-2015 development agenda. Um, and not everybody has the same perception. Um, there are big challenges, and there's a clear role for science. So those are what I want to emphasize. I'm not going to answer or even cover all the territory. I, I just want to make some key issues to kind of incite people for the, uh, for the, the rest of the conference. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about the future, because, um, and maybe it's just because I'm getting older, but we, te we tend to always think more about the past than we do about the future sometimes, because the future is, is more uncertain. Um, then I'm going to talk about the development agenda for post-2015, the role of science and evidence, and then I've got some reflections. I'm going to make two reflections at the end, um, so that we have plenty of time. Now, there's very different views of food systems to 2050, or even to 2030, or even to 2020. Um, and I'm not going to read these, but to give you an idea that, you know, there's a kind of pessimistic view, uh, almost Malthusian view of what's going to happen in future. Um, and we do have a lot of humanitarian crises and things like that. So, th you know, there's some evidence, some support for a very pessimistic view. And there's also the optimists um, who say, look, yeah, we're sorting this out. Costas is going to speak to you tomorrow. He's here. Or he, I'm not sure if he's here this morning, but I met him last night. Um, Costas Stamoulis from FAO. And he said it should be easier in the next four decades than it was previously. Um, and uh, I, I like the one on top, feeding the world might as well be a marketing slogan for big ag. <laughs> Let's ramp up sales. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of perspectives. And what, what is the evidence that people take an optimistic or a pessimistic view, and how do they pull things together? But uh, there are a lot of contested visions of what the future is going to look like and what the big issues are. And I think that's one of the challenges of the post-2015 agenda. Uh, now, we know there's going to be traumatic changes, and the low- and middle-income countries are changing a lot. Um, the rich countries are changing more slowly. Um, and we know there's going to be changes in population, um, and, the, and that's going to be in the nature of the numbers of people. Uh, it's also, if you can look in the background, you'll see a kind of stooped-over person with a cane. Many, uh, some populations are getting older, and it's... The rich countries are getting older faster. Japan's taking the lead on this, but a country like China is going to be getting quite a bit older uh, in the coming decades as well. So dramatic changes, all the growth basically in population happening in less developed countries, and a lot of it in Africa. And other big changes to those populations. They're urbanizing, and they're having rising incomes. And I think um, one of the things that's going to be very important for food systems, which I'm going to talk about, is the fact that rising incomes are quite important, and we're having kind of enabled uh, consumers at unprecedented levels. Okay? If you think of the last two decades, we probably doubled the number of middle class in the world, and that process is going to continue. That has dramatic changes on sustainability, on health, on all kinds of issues. Massive changes. Um, and that's probably a bigger... It's, it's that growth of income that's probably even a bigger change than the growth in actual number of people. It's what those people do. Now, uh, food production prices and hunger. This slide is really the kind of the good news that according to agriculture, or at least the agriculture that deals with staples and has, is a kind of post-green revolution agriculture. So if you look 
um, we've been very successful in reducing food prices, increasing food production, uh, reducing the number of undernourished, uh, and this has actually taken place from the mid-1970s. We had quite a crisis of around kind of food and energy in the mid-70s, and it's, it's been kind of clear sailing since then at macro level. Now, it's not quite that pretty if you look at nutritious foods. Probably the price of vegetables has doubled in real terms in the same time, and it uses a lot of water and other things. Uh, price of milk and eggs and fish, they've gone up. They haven't gone down. So the staples are relatively cheaper than they were 50 years ago, and the perishables that we need the poor to eat more of have gone up. So it's not a completely good news story. But th this is the kind of the good news according to the CGIR, the post-Green Revolution. Oops, going the wrong direction here. Now, there are some bumps, um, and one of the big bumps and that had a lot of influence on agricultural development was the food price crisis of 2008. Um, and this was a price crisis largely in staples, um, and it was largely market-driven. And most of the market forces that did, led to this volatility were driven by government decisions about trade and export bans in particular, because, uh, and a lot of rice was the one that went up the most, and that was largely because there's only four or five countries in the world that, that trade a significant amount of rice, and most of them stopped trading, and that, that caused a huge problem. So getting people to remain calm is one of the biggest things to av avoid volatility. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot and emphasizing consumption but I wanted to acknowledge that there's lots of production challenges out there. And um, as you can see by this graph, the red stars are the kind of places where we have huge water crises and where we're probably going to have to de-intensify agriculture as we move forward, uh, particularly places like the, the Western Indo-Gangetic Plains, for example, um, United States, Australia, etc. The green areas are we, where we have significant deforestation. The brown stars are where we have significant and very significant land, de land degradation. And the kind of purple circles are where we've really got growing rural populations and very intensive land use. I mean, if you look at some of the areas of West Africa or East Africa, they're almost like small town, rural small towns. I mean, there's so many people per square kilometer now. Um, hundreds of people per square kilometer. You know, the, the, we're not talking really about viable farming units. We're talking about households with gardens around them, more or less. So, especially in Africa, there's a lot of fragmentation of farmlands. Quite interesting. So there are some huge challenges, but there's also opportunities as well. And we're going to have to do things differently. But you always hear about sustainable intensification, for example. There, I think there's also going to have to be some sustainable de-intensification in certain areas and some rebalancing as well. And I think you're going to hear more about the kind of sustainability side in the next, in the next speech. Now, um, we like to think of a global world, but it's not. There's a lot of significant differences between regions, and I noticed in the conference that you're breaking off into different regional groups, which I think is wise. And if you look at Latin America, it's very different than a lot of the low- and middle-income regions, and it's the richest part. Uh, it's the most urbanized and it has larger farms. Um, they're much more engaged in large farming activities and export. There's a lot of opportunities for intensification, higher value. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in Latin America, uh, I think, and it's, it's kind of one where the world, you know, agriculture knows how to deal with those issues. Africa is more challenging. It has, there's still the population's mostly rural. It has very small farms, and they're getting smaller, and that's a function of demographics, and I think lack of outside opportunities beyond rural areas. So we don't get the kind of industrial pull that we got in China or other countries in Asia for, for employment off the farm. So people would like to get off the farm, but they can't, and so there's, there's a lot of issues of moving up and moving out in terms of rural populations. A lot of undernutrition. There are huge yield gaps, so there's a lot of opportunities. And there's tremendous underinvestment in things like irrigation, for example. So there's a lot of opportunities to improve things if Africa can get its act together to do them. Uh, and, but there's going to be major impacts on climate change. So a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty in Africa, but also a lot of opportunity. So this is really the interesting continent in many ways in terms of how things are going to happen. 
South Asia is a kind of mixture. It has some very sophisticated farms, some unsophisticated ones, um, egg, it, but it's also got a very strong political culture. And I'll discuss a little bit, kind of looking at food systems, the roles of policy, technology, and institutions when it comes to food systems. And I'm going to use India as an example because it's very interesting. Um, but it's got, it's like two worlds almost, the, the, the shining India and the, and the backward India, if you want. Um, then East and Southeast Asia has had the most dramatic changes, uh, massive industrial growth, even industrial agriculture, this huge kind of livestock farming, uh, pigs and poultry, etc. They have huge challenges of natural resources, degradation, uh, which other people have experienced before. But they have good technical skills, there's a lot of, of challenges, big challenges in kind of quality and safety of agricultural products and food and things like that. So some governance issues, um, but the, a lot of progress um, and a lot of capacity to do things. So very different pictures and opportunities looking forward in these regions that we need to keep in mind. Now a thing that preoccupies me is the kind of, I, I said that I was emphasizing food, well, Obviously, the outcomes of food are nutrition and health, and um, the world is quite interested in this problem at the moment. Um, and we started getting interested be because of the kind of humanitarian crisis associated with stunting and the fact that we're not actually really improving it very much. And the reason for that is because it's complex, and it's not just about food. It's about food and water and sanitation and gender empowerment and social protection and a lot of things. So that's challenging, and I think one of the key things in agriculture is to actually set the boundary collectively for what do we contribute to the stunting issue. But the other sad thing is that we're, and sometimes in the same people, we're getting a huge problem of people moving from being stunted as children and obese as adults. And you see it in the same families, you certainly see it in the same countries. And this is a huge problem. Um, India, for example, a huge problem of non-communicable non diseases, especially diabetes. This is the diabetes capital of the world. Um, and it has huge implications for health care. India spends about 2% of GDP on health care now. It's going to be 10% soon because A, they have all these enabled consumers who are going to demand it, and B, they're going to have a huge problem. Um, and so this is a big issue that we're going to come back to, um, and it's linked. The quality of diet is at the center of all of this, among a number of other things. Uh, let's look a little bit at food availability because it's quite interesting and, and referring back to the slide I just showed. So huge disparities in the amount of food available in rich countries, middle-income countries, and poor countries, but still pretty good calories available even in poor countries. It's also the nature of the food that's very different. Okay, so in low-income countries, if you take a country like Bangladesh, there's almost, all not, there's almost no diet diversity. I mean, basically, people are just re eating rice most of the time, poor people. And if they're lucky, they're sprinkling a few things on it. Okay? But, but rice has made a huge... I mean, improvements in rice have been a big deal in Bangladesh and really helped a lot. Um, so, so less kind of good things to eat on top of the, of the basic staple diet in low-income countries but less bad things too. So this kind of uh, wedge of red is the bad things. And you see as we get richer that the bad things get bigger and that's where we have to have policies and regulations and incentives and consumer behavior and all kinds of things going on so that we don't kill ourselves with our food. And, and, and so there's very different issues around the world but the quality of diets is linking them all together. And this, this slide actually comes from the medical people. And our colleagues in medicine are very interested now in nutrition in a way they haven't been for 150 years. And that is because of non-communicable diseases. Okay? And if you look at the kind of shares of calories, and I don't really need to go through this in much detail, uh, you'll, you'll see big, big differences in the countries. So, so that's kind of a scene setter of, of how things are going to look um, in the future and what some of the big issues are. And we need to keep these, and we, you know, I find myself forgetting them. It's, it's good to think about when you're looking at the future of food systems to think about those things. Now, 
How does this fit into what's happening in New York and what's been happening for the last few years and what should happen in the next few years? Well, what about from a, from a view of scientists and researchers, like most of us are, but even from development partners? Um, one of the most positive things for me in development in, in the time that I've spent in it is now we put a real emphasis on the countries to, to own, lead, and be accountable for development. It's not, they're the leaders, and the rest of us are the supporters. And this is a huge sea change, and we need to get behind this 100%. Now, one of the things that's different from the post-2015 development agenda compared to the MDGs is that this isn't just about developing countries, it's about all countries. And I think in the MDG process, the low-income countries in particular felt set up. They were given all these responsibilities, not resources, no, you know, there was no real expectation management. They, they feel like they were set up. And, uh, but if it's going to cover the whole world, it's going to be a combination, and it is a combination of sustainability and development goals. But those bring us all together, and it shows that we all have strengths and weaknesses as, com as countries. Um, and I think that's a very positive kind of political move as well. Now, the challenge is that the MDGs were much simpler, and we had much simpler measures of indicators. Now there's much broader range of goals and many indicators. And I don't know, I'm sure there's people in this room. I went to many meetings uh, pre-2015 about how do we get more nutrition into the, into the development agenda and into the goals and indicators, how do we get more health in. I'm sure people were doing it on water and Thomas was doing it on climate change and so everybody was trying to get their stuff in and it shows. It's, it's quite a medley of things. But that's, that's all right. So what are the implications for us as scientists? Um, the first thing we have to remember is that this isn't a science process. This 2015 development agenda is a political process, and it's organized by an organization that's an intergovernmental organization full of politicians. This is a political process. Um, and failing to recognize this means that we will fail to contribute to it you know, positively. But it does provide a framework for actions for different groups, and that's all the different groups here, so development partners, investors, as well as scientists. And so the challenge for us is, how can we, with our science, support and influence this process kind of constructively with innovations, with knowledge and evidence? So that's the kind of framing for our role as, as scientists in the post-2015 agenda. Now, uh, Madeline already mentioned, and I've got it highlighted in red here, the big goal for agriculture. And I mean, talk about putting everything together in one basket, it's all there. Um, but we do have a lot of influence, and I just took out the goals where the CGIR thinks it's contributing to and where we have specific outcomes linked to the goals. Um, I'm in a program that has a lot to do with health as well, with poverty, with water. And so, and other ones have to, you know, we have a big program on climate change and other things. So, it, it is a mixture as well as this very complicated goal number two. Now, looking at that goal number two and linking between different development goals, I think food is a very useful way to look at it. I mean, between agriculture and nutrition or agriculture and health, we have food. Um, Food is the thing that everybody cares about. Um, and so there's been a, a lot of thinking, I would say an explosion of thinking in the last 10 years about food systems. It's not that it didn't go on before, but it mostly happened in rich countries. And, uh, but there's been an explosion of thinking, and from many different perspectives. This is just one of hundreds of frameworks for food systems. It's one that's much more kind of biologically oriented. It's kind of a biological value chain, if you wish. Some of these frameworks are useful in certain contexts. Some of them are more globally, use, globally useful. Uh, none of them are correct. Um, it's the classic thing about models and frameworks, that, that all are wrong and some are useful. They all, or a lot of them, I wouldn't say all of them, uh, most of them, and I think a danger of many of us who come from the agriculture side is that we get into kind of supply push side. What does the world need rather than the consumption-led? 
And when we're talking about nutrition and health issues, consumption-led is very important. We have to keep thinking, reminding ourselves that these countries, and I guess you don't need a reminder if you visit them, especially low- and middle-income countries, that they're growing economically, and then the whole nature of the food system is changing, and that value is moving off the farm. It's moving to other parts of the food chain. And that's critical to remember, because there's going to be a lot of other activities, and some countries are planning that out in terms of their agricultural growth strategies. Now, it's important in a food system, I mean, the reason that the system's thinking is there be, because we need the convergence of different types of innovations and interventions, technical, institutional, and policy, they need to come together, and I'll talk about that in the Indian context. And usually when we do system thinking, it lags behind. We're, we're trying to catch up to the... And we're talking about places where the dynamic change in the systems is unprecedented in human history, basically. And so th this is important. Now I want to talk a little bit about how technology institutions and policy come together in a country like India. So I've highlighted in yellow the boxes that look at consumption because we've been thinking about this in a consumption-led way, which is very important because there's huge disparities, equity uh, disparities in India, and there's huge health outcome disparities, which we have health partners working on. But really thinking about what are the drivers of consumption in terms of marketing and behavior change, in terms of food availability and food price, which is often known as food access, um, what, what's driving that? Well, a lot of what's driving it for poor people is actually public policy. There's a lot of, I mean, India's public policy works on rights-based systems now. So it's got something in common with Sweden. And uh, they have right to employment, and now they have right to food. And so there's huge public distribution systems that distribute mostly staples. Um, but they also distribute health care. So, so there's a huge kind of public policy agenda that's very important. But then when you look at the agri-food markets and how food gets delivered, there's huge public policy issues associated with agri-food systems. Incredible subsidies. And this is the, the kind of the post-green revolution agenda. A lot of water problems, a lot of other problems because of subsidies that are very difficult politically to unwind. Um, a lot of investment, a lot of regulation, and a lot of things are happening around the policies and regulations. Um, if you look at agri-food markets, huge problems of efficiencies in primary production from a lot of small farms. Infrastructure has been a huge issue in India. It's getting better now. Um, and a lot of it's happening by the private sector, though. Um, we look, there, there's an interesting paper called The Silent Revolution in kind of um, agri-food systems, looking at the coal chains that have developed in India, largely with private sector, and largely you have to find out about them, you, you don't see them. Um, but there's, there's huge kind of coordination issues there. And we also need a lot of innovation, and there's a lot of innovation in India. How do we capture that? I mean, I've been talking to people about food innovations. There isn't any, anything they haven't thought about. It's incredible, uh, the kind of food innovations that go on. Now, let's look at another company, because, I mean, a constant thing that's been, I guess, a thread through this conference for many years is the implications of scale. I'm not going to talk about time, but time is the other big variable, obviously. Um, and, and let's look at Ethiopia, which is really trying very hard in kind of food and nutrition security for a number of reasons. Um, and, and I'm just going to focus a bit on the National Agricultural Growth Corridor, Agricultural Transformation. So they're really working hard on this, but... It's largely focused on primary agriculture production. They haven't thought so much about the infrastructure or logistics of how to link that through, but that, that will come. Then it's a regional country, and the regions have a lot of powers. They're listed here. And they do a lot of the primary agriculture. They do the land use planning. They do a lot of the training and knowledge. Uh, so they need to be coordinated in. And then the districts kind of do a lot of the social things, as well as developing local entrepreneurs and local markets. Um, and a kind of counterweight to the agricultural growth strategy of, of Ethiopia that's been very interesting is something called the Productive Safety Net Program, which looks at the areas that are left out of the growth corridors. And it's been going on for about eight or 10 years, and we've seen quite a bit of improvement in households in these regions in terms of even nutrition security, but largely poverty indicators 
But it takes six or seven years to, to help these households get on their feet. But this has been very successful. So this is, this is a kind of mixture of technical policy interventions bringing together social and biological factors, which is very interesting in Ethiopia. And they have a very good nutrition food and nutrition strategy. Which brings me to the next point, which is we really need to bring together the biological and social sciences in dealing with these issues. Um, and so I gave you the example of this productive safety net program as being one that's very interesting in showing the benefits of bringing the social and the, and the kind of technical together. One of the big debates that goes on, especially in food and nutrition security, is do we invest in production diversity or do we invest in markets? And obviously it's a bit of a mixed bag. Where markets exist, you get pretty good food diversity. And even in kind of aid programs for food aid, we can really make them work better if there's functioning markets by just giving people money rather than giving them food. It makes the money go three or four times farther. So markets are going to be very important, but production diversity in, in some places. And the production diversity doesn't have to be at the household level, but it needs to be in that region if infrastructure is poor. Now at the household level, one of the big issues in terms of resilience and equity is health shocks. Most people get poor because of health shocks. And it's usually multiple health shocks. So somebody dies, somebody, you know, somebody else happens. If it's a dramatic shock, it can be one thing. But poverty and health tend to be really linked together. And gender is an important issue at household level, um, the gender relations. And obviously, there's a lot of friction in gender relations and gender empowerment as economic times change, as roles change, as, as income and employment changes. And so this is very important. And it's the relative roles of men and women. You know, it's not just empowering women. They've, they've got to deal in a world where men are also there. So it's, it's these relative roles that are important. Let me go back to the country ownership and leadership because as scientists, we've got to use some vehicles to help the countries. Um, and the countries have some of their own vehicles. If I think of Africa, Comprehensive Africa and Agricultural Development Program is really starting to catch stream, uh, catch uh, steam. And uh, so countries have implementation plans, they're investing, and we can get behind this. Um, and we do get behind this. Also, the sun is the scaling up nutrition. And that's been a big integrator of agriculture, nutrition, education, nutrition in other countries. Now, one of the major research areas, and this is work that IFPRI is very good at, but we work with colleagues, you're going to meet Jim Sundberg from, from IDS in the UK, on policy processes, essential capacities, incentives, thinking about this kind of country enabling of how we can make agriculture and nutrition work better. This is a really important research area. There's also a critical role for monitoring, evaluation, and accountability. Um, and one great vehicle we have for this is the Global Nutrition Report, which is being launched today, I think. Um, and it's, um, it had a Washington launch last week, but I think at the, at the General Assembly it's being launched today. Um, and, that, and that's a very valuable tool, which is all about countries and how we can help countries. And it's, it's well done. Two reflections on the role of, of science and the challenges and opportunities to close. One is on evidence, and I started the presentation by talking about the optimists and the pessimists, and they, they have the same evidence available. So what's going to change in evidence? Well, first of all, I think the stats that most of us learned are going out the window pretty quickly. Um, it's a lot more about big data, and it's a lot more about you know, intensive mathematical statistics, looking at statistics and how we use all the information, perfect and unperfect. So it's not just setting up our perfect experiment, it's, it's very different. And so there's huge changes in, in that, which biologists have to get onto and social scientists. The other is there's different perspectives on evidence, which I notice very much in our program. On the bottom left, you've got a picture of the cover of Lancet, where we did a big evidence review of what works for agriculture and nutrition. And it's very much a public health you know, we're doing randomized clinical trials, and there's a long culture and history for that. But it doesn't take, you know, it's a very precise tool for measuring evidence. It doesn't deal very well with food systems, where we need different kinds of ways of looking at that, and how do we bring those different pieces of information together. Huge challenge. The second one is, what science do we need more of? Because it's a changing world. And if you look at the right-hand side, 
and food systems, the kind of sweet spot in the middle where we need things together to come together are that we're somehow marrying the food people want, which is often not very good for them, with the food they need, the nutritious food they need, what they're able to pay for, which is a constraint for the private sector, what the planet can sustain, and what people can feasibly do. I mean, we've got small farmers, we've got value chains in different countries. They can do some things and they can't do other things, and they're willing to do some things. So what's that sweet spot? What do we need? To, how are we going to uncover that? Well, we need a lot more information on consumption and choice, so that brings in more psychology and behavior. We need system science clearly and linking up both health issues and sustainability issues. We need a lot more food science and food safety because the value is moving off the farm. We need economics to help us with these trade-offs in terms of valuation, which is very weak now in my opinion, and on cost effectiveness. And we need a lot more how-to science, business management science. So I see these as some of the scientific areas growing. So I hope that stimulates a little bit of discussion of how this works and I've helped to frame things a little bit and uh, I'm really looking forward to our discussions over the next couple of days. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. A very interesting presentation and brief enough, in spite of the fact you covered all these <laughs> issues, uh, that we can have a few questions or comments from the audience. I wonder if there's anyone who Do you mind if I sit down? You can all see Go me, ahead, right? please. I feel at home. Well, it makes me feel more as a discussant than a... <laughs> than the professor. <laughs> okay. Very good. Any... I would like to start off then abusing my role as moderator here and ask you to expand a little bit. One of your slides you discussed in food systems, the tendency for supply push rather than consumption-led. And I was thinking to myself, that poses an interesting challenge for agricultural researchers because most of us are production specialists. How do we link up with consumption trends and behavior? Hmm. That's why. Um, Anyone else have a... Yeah, do you want to collect some? Anyone? Everyone's very quiet this morning. You'd think it's Monday morning. Uh, thank you very much, John, for uh, that very stimulating uh, presentation. I was taken with uh, just a point you, was, you mentioned about markets, the importance of markets moving forward. And I wondered how you can insert the whole discussion around inclusive markets. Because mm. as you and I know, uh, markets are not this objective arbiter out there. Uh, thank you as well. It, it was a great presentation. My question relates to the SDGs, and as you pointed out, it's a political process and they will be decided by the UN General Assembly. But I worry about the indicators. UN Statistics Bureau mm. said that there are much too many mm. and they can't be measured uh, at the country level. So what do you see the role of science to continue to be involved? In some areas I know that they are very much involved in trying to really focus on which ones can be measured, what's realistic. And I think most would agree that the current list is unrealistic, and you indicated mm -hmm. that as well. So how do we engage in the future process post the decision this week? Mm. Okay, I think I'll let him. Okay, one more. Uh, just hold on. You have plenty to answer. Would you like one more? Or sure. Why not? Then we have to. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Costas Tabunis. Thank you very much for. I'm the editor of the Economist on the food security. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, actually, I I don't want to elaborate on this. I would still say the same thing, mm. but there is a whole bunch of other stuff that followed the statement, which of course are not reported. But I I still think that producing the food is not the big issue. Yes. But um, let, me, let me make two points, and I, I'm glad that my presentation is not after yours, because this is really captivating and excellently <laughs> delivered, so congratulations. One is if we isolate the issue of research from the issue of the governance of the food system, which gets a lot more complicated, um, in my view, um, uh, the governance of 
um, the research system, especially of public research, which seems to be crumbling, mm. uh, then we, we will do um, a partial job, right? We will do a ceteris paribus analysis of the role of science in a, in a little bit of a vacuum. Of course, you can't address everything in one conference, but I hope we are, this complexity of the governance of the food system and the new actors um, is, is really uh, something that uh, wants to touch upon. The second point has to do with data, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how we're going to solve the conundrum of the privatization of a lot of important databases um, by Google, by um, other big companies, um, and, and how we will deal with this, especially as international organizations, right? I'm sure that universities are also interested mm. in this, but something we have to put our hands on. Again, it's not on your plate, in your plate necessarily, but this is something one yeah. is worth talking about. Thank, Thank you. you. My boss is moderating the panel discussion tomorrow. He's going to be angry at me for <laughs> stealing all your answers. But go ahead, please. OK. So um, on the supply push, your, your question, um, the, the, um, I mean, I go back to my own per So I was in agriculture, well, kind of a combination of agriculture and public health research for a long time in Africa. And, you mentioned I was there for 25 years. Well, about halfway through, I got tired of pushing things that nobody wanted. Um, Jim, actually, who's here, wrote, uh, wrote a paper, which I really enjoyed at one point, called The Logic of Legumes, <laughs> which said, you know, we've got a thousand different reasons why legumes, and this is a lot for fodder and things as well, why, why everybody should have these, but nobody takes them up. So then I thought, okay, no, let's look at why people take things up. And we got, in Ilry, we got much more involved in market-oriented systems for dairy and those kinds of things. Then I was much happier because we were interacting with people, kind of linking up consumption and production, and then farmers were much happier too. So it wasn't just smart people telling less smart people what to do. We were engaging in the system, and I thought that was really good. Which then links nicely with Margaret's question about uh, markets and inclusive markets. This is very important, and I... Um, I just want to give the example of, <clears throat> you know, when we look at technical issues, and food safety is an important issue in markets, for example, especially when we're talking about all these perishables. Um, some of my colleagues have been working on an interesting project called Safe Food, Fair Food, because especially in informal markets and things, there's a huge problem of regulating and giving poor people a chance to participate in these markets. And, and you know, Poor people in informal markets, they have all kinds of risks. They're social, they're economic, they're, they're food safety, they're other things. And so they don't, they don't have this perfect world. They can't just avoid a hazard or something. You know, they can't stop eating GM if some of them won't have food to eat. So, so you know, they've got to navigate these things. And, they've got to, and, and so if we can help them with the kind of frameworks that think about who benefits and thinking about how poor people benefit, and as you know, because we've been involved in many, many meetings on this, looking at the role of gender in, in value chains, is, it's a very dangerous tool, value chains for women. Um, and and the, 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 So there's a whole issue there, and I, that's, an, I think, enough on that for now. On the SDGs, yeah, th what you say is very true. And there was a detailed survey done earlier this year with all the statistical agencies in the different countries that were going to look at this. And, Half the stuff they don't even have a clue how to measure, and about they can only probably measure about 15 or 20 percent of the indicators. Now, I don't know exactly how that's going to be overcome from the kind of bureaucratic side. Um, I'm guessing there'll be a lot. I, no I noticed that the Kenyan statistical agency was getting a grant of 50 million dollars the other day. So imagine there'll be a big boom in statistical agencies. But, but also. What I think would be good is actually to move back from the indicators a little bit, and this is something that we're working on quite hard, and look at the kind of pathways to impact and who are the key actors in those, and what are the assumptions about how change is going to happen, which is what I call theory of change, and then try and pick out how that change is going to happen and get some intermediate milestone steps for how, you know, because there's no use saying, okay, here's now, here's 2030, Let's, let's think about how-to issues rather than just the indicator issues at the end. And finally, on the research, um, yeah, I worry about public research 
because it's going to be really required in low-income countries. One of the things that's important in the short term, especially around, I mean, I'm coming from a policy institute, is that we have champions who can do what we can do. They can do the economic analysis. They can make the case. They can be, you know, forceful influencers. And so we spend a lot of time working on those, those champions and how, how they do that, and then that gives us a good interface. The data, I don't have a lot of answers. I mean, there's, we're trying different types of partnership things. But yeah, this kind of who owns what is going to be a big issue that needs to be dealt with in terms of governance. I think we do need a lot of research around governance issues, and I propose some of that in terms of the country policy processes, et cetera. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we have to move on okay. to our next keynote. Thank you. Thank you.